Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Arnie Lukes here at the Crossroads, and I'd like to welcome my two guests from Canada. Welcome, Robert Clink. Hello, Arnie. No worries. Good pleased. to see you again. And you, Robert. Please, always pleased to have you. And brother Wallace. Hello, Wallace Clink. Well, I'm pleased to be visiting you in Australia. We had a little bit of snow today, which isn't supposed to happen this time of the year. Okay. But it didn't it didn't stay. It was not uh, severe. Okay. Well, but well. anyway, um, and we are supposedly entering a phase of beginning at least partial relaxation of the uh, isolation that's been imposed upon us for this quite some time now that's right the, um, the virus yeah yeah <clears throat> yep okay well that actually gives us a lead into um to an article that i picked up this morning and i'll just cut across to it Natural News, it's talking about Germany reopening has been set back after a surge in new coronavirus cases. And I think that that is vitally important to understand because um, we're experiencing the same thing in Australia, that there is there <clears throat> is an inference of relaxing the, uh, the lockdown, but there are some states that are adamantly resisting. And those states, in my view my assessment of them publicly, privately and in writing is that they are Bolshevik driven and uh, controlled by Bolshevik governments. And uh, and I think that that's very, very important to take this into account, that if the, uh, the, the hope, the promise of relaxing the sanctions or at least the, um, the lockdown, and then they pull the rug out from under us, um, I noted that uh, in some areas, people are already starting to demonstrate in France um, in Italy, I saw that uh, politician over the weekend, and in um, Melbourne, I believe it was in Victoria, in Australia, um, people are taken to the streets because uh, they're not satisfied that it's justified. Your thoughts, Robert Clink? Well, it's been uh, established, I think, that uh, the uh, uh, governments who've imposed this policy have done so on the basis of uh, false projections, wrong projections, and they are not now admitting that. Uh, so I think that they are determined to keep this situation of social distancing and uh, suggesting people wear masks when they're outside and all this sort of thing is intended to persist. And all this business, they, they're all talking about uh, relenting and relaxing the stringency of the conditions, but on the same, by the same token, you see uh, newspaper articles that suggest that, that what's being done is insane. People are being arrested for being alone on a beach. They're being one person who went out on the ocean in a boat was <laughs> was uh, uh, tracked down by the uh, the uh, what do they call it? The coast Coast uh, uh, Patrol and and obliged to go back to shore and go home. Well, what in the world is this? It's insanity. Mm. How, how is anybody doing anyone any damage with this? So I think that we're just going to be played like a yo-yo. And they're going to keep this going and they're going to say, oh, well, there's a, a return of the threat. So we're going to have to tighten things down again. And in fact, uh, people like Bill Gates are saying nothing is going to go back to normal for at least uh, 18 months. And uh, uh, it's, I, I think this is the long range plan. Yeah. Frankly, I think that we have witnessed a coup. It's just, you could call it a fascist coup or a communist coup, whatever you want to want to call it. But instead of they, for a coup, you always have to have some kind of external threat. And the Nazis found that threat in the, in the Jewish uh, community and the communists found it in the Kulaks and the thing is that the virus had just been uh, introduced as this external threat that has allowed governments everywhere, but not on a national scale now, on an international scale, to conduct a coup and to suppress uh, hard-won freedoms everywhere in the world. That's a, that's a very interesting summary, Robert. And uh, I take into account that uh, governments are not necessarily um, preaching from their own, if you like, pew sheet. They're actually preaching from others' pew sheet. 
and the World Health Organization being a public and private partnership, significantly financed, I believe 85% is financed by foundations, which of course the Bill and Melinda Gates and the Rockefellers and the and the World Bank, the IMF, all these sorts of foundations, huge, if you like, central capital centres are responsible for imposing policy through our governments. So the pew sheet that they're playing to, even though it's a combination of, if you like, the what I refer to as the citadel of communism is the is the uh, United Nations, and the if you like the um, citadel of capital, and that of course is the International Monetary Fund, the Bank of International Settlements, the World Bank. So you've got the nexus, the coming together of communism and capitalism, and that's the pew sheet that our I believe our governments are playing from. Your thoughts, Wallace Clink. Well, there's no doubt about it. It's the financial power that is involved here at the apex. Uh, they, um, they have exercised enormous power over the destiny of humanity for many, many, many generations. And they want to not only retain that power, but they want to solidify it, secure it, mm -hmm. absolutely. And that is their objective. And you can be assured that anything that is coming in the way of policy from these quarters is going to be um, involving the centralization of power over general humanity and the um, disempowering of the average citizen. Because you can't have power in two different opposing places. It has to be either here or there. Can't be in both places. Yeah, yeah. So you can, I think there's no doubt that uh, this is a very, very precarious situation because I think that it may be a test case in social control to see just how easily and readily the population will succumb to external direction and bullying of this kind. And uh, it may be that it's just a prelude to another phase of a similar nature which may come could come in the form of another um, another uh, virus or it could come in the form of some other as you said uh, Arnie, external threat yeah. because the external threat has always been the real justification for the clamping down on the um, population of a given country yeah yeah, no, I, no, I noted that um, external threats, of course, were used extensively in the lead up and justification for invasion, uh, invasion of countries, invasion. I mean, America did it uh, with the Twin Towers, <clears throat> the threat. Um, and Germany was doing it in the lead up to the invasion of other nations. And, and so it's always there, this external threat, um, not necessarily always immediately obvious sometimes you've got to go digging digging for it your thoughts um robert clink well uh <laughs> the external threat it goes back to sun tzu doesn't it in the yeah. art of war and uh, this is just a, a standard tactic it's been used for thousands of years and for some strange reason <laughs> in all that time the general population doesn't seem to have caught on but as I say, I regard what's going on now as just a, a garden variety coup operating on the same principles as coups have been conducted on uh, forever. And uh, it is used to uh, mobilize uh, a population. Uh, they uh, get uh, everybody thinking that they're participating in a cause. And so you end up with society divided you end up with people snitching on their neighbors which is just horrific you know but they they do it because they're motivated by the belief that they're doing a good thing mm -hmm. there was a there was a woman in uh, stalin's russia i i can't pronounce her name but she was in uh, kiev and she was a professional denouncer and she ended up sending eight thousand people to prison or possibly to their deaths because she kept denouncing them for anti-social activities. Uh, she, her career came to an end only when 
she denounced Khrushchev <laughs> for his uh, uh, anti-social activities when he was uh, operating in the Ukraine. And uh, finally, Stalin gave up on her and uh, didn't credit her anymore. But he, she was very convenient because she terrorized uh, her entire community and she uh, was identifying uh, people who were not not happy with the regime. Yeah. And we're, we're seeing the same thing here. This is the way a tyranny gets imposed. And it's, a, it's an old technique that goes back to the beginning of time. And I really wish that people would uh, see it clearly because there's nothing new about what's going on. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Robert. And I would direct our, our viewers to um, have a look at our website online, uh, the library at ALOR.org, the library, because in that is the works of Sun Yat-su, The Art of War. And also there's another book there called The Complete Art of War. Now, um, when you're thinking about your effectiveness of saying, OK, I don't necessarily agree with what's going on, but I'm only one and I can't do anything. Um, I would suggest to you that that's not actually the correct way to think. There's a book in, in our library. It's written about the SAS, the Special Air Service of Rhodesia, and it's called The Elite. And it's a wonderful book because it shows you how just a small group of active individuals can achieve significant amounts of influence in any given circumstance. Now, the, the government thinks it's got its own way. <laughs> It's imposing a policy that's coming from, if you like, private institutions. Um, the World Health Organization being the front, if you like, the front counter for uh, huge foundations, drug companies, and things like that. In Australia, it's got a uh, we've got a thing called the Therapeutic Goods, and and they are essentially the front counter for the pharmaceutical industry instead of being actual uh, medicine, practicing medicine. It's more or less just uh, uh, selling a product. Now, this, this whole exercise that's going on, the right to your very own body, the right to the use and discipline and whatever of your own body. You can put a tattoo on your body at a certain age, but it's uh, Bill Gates is of the view that you shouldn't have a right to refuse a vaccine. Now, our governments have historically imposed um, drugs on us, mass medication in the form of fluoride. And, um, and the thing is that you've got to consider these things as, well, hang on a sec, where is the boundary of government? Where is it? Where is its rightful position? Because we can see what's going wrong and it's okay for us to, okay, there's a coup going on. What can we do about it? What can we do about it? There are many things that we can and we've now got to consider that because that's the position we find ourselves in, that the, the world government is attempting to be imposed on us and we've got to resist, but not only resist, but place the correct principles on the board in association of how we're actually going to recover and rebuild from this position. Your thoughts, Wallace Clink? Well, you have to make up your mind about one thing. Governments are either divine and incapable of error, or they are merely mortal and they can, <clears throat> they can err and when they have excessive power, when they err, they can cause enormous damage. Mm -hmm. And that is what has happened in the past. With these dreadful wars that we've become embroiled in, drawn into, in the interests of special interests, not in the interests of the general population. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it, um, it has to be looked at. And it seems to me that it's kind of the ultimate uh, well, it's uh, to ascribe uh, all knowledge or, or wisdom or all virtue uh, in the hands of any government seems to me as a form, the ultimate form of error and idolatry. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do that, it seems to me it's a lot better to have, there's, there's only one safe place for power in many hands, mm -hmm. because that way, they can't all co coalesce to achieve some damaging policy because you have alternate forces at work. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important for us to re retain 
to maintain freedom of association, freedom of communication, and general interchange with each other as individuals, because it's rather hard to pin down power that resides in everybody. That's a very important um, comment, Wallace, and I, I actually visualizing in this, the, this question of vaccines, and uh, I'm of the view, and I believe it's justified, uh, I've read documents on it, that the, the, if you like, the scientific justification of efficacy for vaccinations has not been substantiated for at least 30 years. The scientific justification. Now, the, you've got to consider that, okay, how would you conduct a demonstration to, to establish efficacy? And you'd say you'd have a certain amount of people who were vaccinated and then a certain amount of people who were not vaccinated. And then look at the statistically, the, the outcome, the environment, the things, the mitigating factors, and all those sorts of things taken into account with errors. And this is the type of thing that has not happened for 30 years. And here we've got a essentially a commercial entity. The World Health Organization is a commercial entity. Our governments are suggesting that we be monitored and we can't be allowed to live a normal life unless we subscribe to the products from that commercial entity. And those products are administered into our very own body, our most private property. Now that is so, so wrong. A commercial entity would have that right. So I suggest that our government is completely out of line and we need to consider ways to pull it into line. Now, historically, we've had constitutions, we've had laws, we've had high courts, Supreme Courts, whatever, where we could argue these things. But at the moment, we're witnessing something that is unprecedented and it's happening to every single nation. And each nation has to take stock of what's going on and each nation has to do, as communities, as individuals, has to do what is necessary to bring power back to the individual. Now, you can't expect to be an irresponsible voter and then expect a politician to be responsible or a bureaucrat to be responsible. Part of this is being a responsible voter. It actually means this thing called self-discipline. It's actually you've got to take stock of your own life first as the first standard, if you like, the first principle in restoring order back to communities. Your thoughts, Robert Clink. Well, in every political campaign, isn't there uh, the situation that every opposition party is complaining about the lack of transparency of the existing government? Mm -hmm. And as soon as they get elected, aren't they just as non-transparent as their predecessors? That's right. I mean, we have to change this situation, but we we become so passive as citizens that we don't uh, insist on being informed by the government about what they're doing. So these people are just planning uh, according to their own whims and wishes uh, completely apart from the population. But there should be an element of collaboration in these things. If, if we had anything approaching a true so-called democracy, then surely there would be a sort of uh, consultation going on and there would be effective means of input in order to control what government is doing. Uh, I think this is actually an opportunity to achieve some reforms in this direction. You mentioned the responsible vote. That's one thing. I think also that it would only make sense for every government to be subject to some method of recall. Mm -hmm because what we're seeing now is governments that are, are becoming increasingly dictatorial, and yet people have no means of reining them in between elections. So uh, the, there should be some uh, method whereby a sufficient percentage of the population uh, desiring a, maybe a referendum on recall could actually achieve this. Mm -hmm. It's something that does exist. Uh, there was uh, a social credit, nominally social credit government in British Columbia that introduced this provision, mm -hmm. and it was actually done on one occasion. An existing government was so unpopular about a tax proposal 
that there was a uh, petition for recall, there was a referendum on recall, and the government was out. Mm -hmm. And that change, that tax change was out as well. Mm -hmm. So this, this is an example of what can be done. And there are, there are other, other uh, uh, techniques of bringing the government to heel uh, so that the population has control over them as well. It's time for creative thinking in this area. And it's, it's, a, it's a critical, critical situation because the governments are all becoming tyrannies. You, get, you elect a, a, a party or a prime minister or a president, and the assumption seems to be that for four years they can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this is completely out of the realm of constitutional government. Mm -hmm. they, just, they just laugh at, at constitutions now. It's a, a situation that is in urgent need of correction. Yeah, no, that's a valid that's a valid observation, um, Robert. I might just lay something on the floor here. I was a, a shop steward um, in a union when I was in the oil and gas industry. I was a shop steward for two years, and I introduced what I call citizens' initiative referenda into the union, and um, we held ballots all the time. Um, I was trying to demonstrate a principle that the actual shop floor should decide certain things and if they were contentious then they should decide things one at a time rather than a package deal and it, we worked through a, a enterprise bargaining agreement and we voted on every facet of the package and the package went through and I think the average vote endorsement was about 87 percent so it certainly was um, endorsed the package went straight through so their representation mm. I was constantly um, working on that I called myself a steward and the um, organizers the state organizers said no you're a delegate and I said no I'm not I'm a steward I will work every day with my members and I will work it through now the word delegate it implies delegated authority and this is what I see with politicians. They see themselves as having this authority delegated uh, in, on a long-term basis. And the only time they're answerable is at the next election. So they can manipulate situations all they like and, uh, and be whatever, be as corruptible as whatever. But come election time, they know how to work the machine and they do it and then they get re-elected. And of course, it's significant manipulation. So... The idea of citizens initiative referenda, recall, and also the re responsible vote, very important. But, but, but the thing is, it doesn't come free. It doesn't come without responsibility on the voter. The voter actually has to participate. And this is why the art of war is so important, because it is actually, it's a strategy. You are at war with power. And if you don't maintain your own power base, your own exercise of your rights, your freedoms, the power that should reside with you, if you don't, then these dictators will rule the world. And this is what's been argued since time immemorial. The 1100s, the Coronation Charter, the 1215 Magna Carta, and 1295, I think it was signed into the common law. That was a 200-year campaign. 200 years to, to pursue something and get it. We've given it up. We've actually given up limited constitutional government for what we consider is a threat for security. We've given up freedom for security. And of course, if you really want to give up freedom for security, just walk into a jail. You've got all the security in the world there. You've got no freedom, but all the security. And that's what we're seeing is a medical lockdown they're imposing a jail situation on us. Might be an open air jail, but it's still a jail. Stay in your homes. Don't come out. Only those that must work are allowed out and only shop when you absolutely have to. And then, of course, only listen to the news, the reports that we give you, a whole sanitized version. We are being placed in jail. We're getting security, but we're losing freedom. And we've got to reconsider this thing called freedom. Your thoughts, Wally Clink. Oh, well, that's right, Arnie. And we have to reconsider what is the purpose of human life, if there is a purpose. And of course, that implies that there is some kind of an originator of this whole scheme of things. But in any case, um, it's not, uh, we associate on different levels, many different levels. But the thing of it is that 
freedom can only be based upon responsibility. Because if you don't have responsibility, you can have no order. And if there is no order, which is effective, there can be no freedom. Because if other people have the right, either collectively or individually, to interfere with your activities, to suppress your activities, you do not have freedom. Mm -hmm. So as Douglas made a point of, in fact, it's the key point of social credit on one level, you have to have the ability to determine what kind of services are being delivered to you. Now, what is the best way to do that? You can either get together collectively and go and take some action against the people whose policies you don't like, or you can simply disenable them. You can disempower them by refusing to accept what they're, what they're dishing out. In other words, when you talk about democracy, People are always talking about political democracy. This is group activity. Mm. It is not individual activity. It's ultimately group activity. And that is a big problem because a group cannot be responsible. Only the individual can be absolutely responsible. And of course, we've had so many problems dealing with our various problems in life that we have um, gone together in groups where responsibility is difficult to obtain, hoping that we could solve our problems by group action. But uh, we, we, what social credit requires as a key, as the key aspect of its political, economic, practical policy, the right of the individual to empower or disempower those who would offer us services or goods by saying, we like your product, we like what you're offering, and we're going to strengthen you by pat patronizing what you're uh, offering. In other words, that will justify your policy. Or we're going to say, no, we don't like your policy, we don't like your product. And we're going to disempower you by simply ignoring you. Mm -hmm. We are not going to participate by accepting what you are offering. And by doing that, it's, it's a much more effective way than getting some kind of a group action, like a labor union or something like that, in order to control industry. Because there's no end to that process. Not only no end to it, but there's no end to its high level of ineffectuality. So what we want is a free society. That means the society to free, choose or refuse one thing at a time. Yeah. And that is what really has the power to change things because yeah. people are not being rewarded for what they're good offering are not going to offer it much longer. And if they see that it's not going to be accepted, they're going to be strongly dissuaded from offering that type of undesirable policy or product. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a very important observation. The right to choose or refuse one thing at a time, and um, having someone impose their choice over you is a denial of your humanity, if you like. It's a denial of your freedom of choice, and especially with such a tyranny being threatened towards us, a medical tyranny, that you will, you shall, you must, and it's just hang on a sec. What sort of madness is that? Are you are you Dr. Frankenstein or what? You know, what gives you the right to impose medical tyranny over my own body? I look after my body and I exercise it and I buffet it and I feed it well and I drink good things and all that sort of stuff. It's all about looking after it. I don't need you to tell me anything. But Bill Gates is of the view that he has not only that uh, better understanding of what uh, he thinks should happen, but he should have that power over the whole world, that power over the whole world. Now, that to me is delusional. We're at the um, just coming up to 30 minutes, so I'm going to call for um, closing comments. Please, Robert Clank. We've seen uh, with this crisis how the revolving door of... Uh, government 
and private interests has created a, a, a true elite that is irresponsible, has no responsibility toward the, the public, and uh, it is also uh, immune to considerations of conflict of interest. This is another thing that has to be uh, dealt with. You know, you have a, a minister who is responsible for health, and when he loses his job, almost certainly he's going to get a job with some big pharmaceutical company or whatever. Well, this is unacceptable. It's just an indication that when he was the minister, he was under the, uh, under the thumb of this organization that could reward him for his good service while he was there. Uh, we've certainly seen this in Canada. Uh, that uh, uh, There's this transfer from the public to the private and back from the private back to the public. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, a situation that is very dangerous and in fact intolerable. So uh, this crisis we're going through is revealing a lot of things uh, about the nature of our uh, of our society, it's also, I think, undermining confidence in institutions that we've always had a high level of confidence in, in the medical profession and in the policing profession. And when these things break down, it's a, it's it's very destructive. I don't don't know if society can recover from a total lot, lot, uh, loss of confidence in institutions like that. But we're seeing it because we're not uh, observing these institutions protecting uh, human rights, which is the primary function they ought to have. Thank you for that, Robert. That's an excellent summary. Your thoughts, um, Wallace Clank? Well, there's no doubt about it that there seems to be now a very definite body of evidence that's come forward to show that we're suffering a lot of problems that are associated with this, uh, this clamp down on our association, this restriction. Uh, those include serious marital breakdowns or difficulties, even including murder, which has also included even other members of the family, children. We have people who have been distraught because of their inability to maintain their level of uh, sustainability from the standpoint of material needs and psychological needs, educational needs, and so on too. And this has caused suicides. As a matter of fact, there have been quite, from what I understand, there's been a significant up, uptick of the occurrences of this negative kind. And uh, I think you have to consider these things as against any potential benefits that uh, authoritarian means of, uh, of you know, uh, the strictures on your association are concerned. So it's not just a question of one aspect of life. It is a large spectrum of life that is being affected. So uh, we can't just give people unrestrained authority to issue dictates with regard to our personal lives and how we conduct them, because it is a, it, it's the basis of an abuse of power, which has very serious consequences, which are not all quite understood, but are very serious. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, uh, Wallace and Robert. It's been an excellent uh, forum today. And looking at the uh, the ramifications, I spent the weekend um, reading about the um, distraught situation it is with people in isolation in nursing homes uh, who live alone and the, um, if you like, the morbidity of what's going on. Also, the fact that an Italian uh, member of parliament has given a significant spray to his parliament over the fact that the allocation of statistics attributing so many people dying from COVID-19, something like 94 or 96% already had a pre-existing morbidity. And, uh, and so it's absurd, the numbers that are coming out. This is a political move. It's a power grab. As you said, Robert, it's a coup. Now, the question is, what are we going to do? And it's not someone else's job 
The fact is there are, there is no Superman out there in a pair of boxer shorts. It's you and I, and we've got to consider it. And we do need to read books such as Sun Yat-Zu, The Art of War. So we recognise that the narrative that's being played out in front of us, that's being painted by the mainstream media, it's a deliberate ploy to confuse us. And so we can't actually be effective in our exercise of freedom. Uh, we've got to reconsider our methods and restructure ourselves and take into account what the enemy, the enemy to freedom, is doing, because that's what it is. Thank you so much, Robert and Wallace Klink, for today's forum. Thank you. Thank you.